The Secret Drawing of Latin America. William Ospina. Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in Hervio, a municipality in the department of Tolima. The Secret Drawing of Latin America. Since the time Bolivar wrote his Jamaica letter, a fundamental task of this continent has been the dialogue between unity and diversity. We would be lying if we said that our America is one, evidence of its plurality emerges everywhere, from the coyote deserts of Sonora to the horizontal vertigo of Patagonia, from the countless blues of the Caribbean to that green that belongs to all the colors of the mountain range and the jungle, from the fiery air of the Caribbean coasts to the white night of the moors, from the fertility of valleys and pampas to what Neruda called the stellar runaway horse of ice. And I am not only talking about the extraordinary geographic and biological diversity but, in it and on it, about the diversity of peoples and their cultures, or about something even more suggestive, the many inalienable nuances of a vast continental culture. In that same letter from Jamaica Bolivar affirmed that we are a small human race. Two centuries later, it is necessary to remove the adjective small from that phrase, and affirm that we are a very broad sample of what the human race is, because perhaps nowhere else on the planet is the diversity of the species more present. Dr. Samuel Johnson once said to James Boswell, My friend, if anyone is tired of London, he is tired of life, because London has all that life has to offer. But what is today the diversity of London, Paris, or New York compared to the diversity of Sao Paulo, Mexico, Buenos Aires or the Antilles? The old metropolises are rushing to imitate us and are rapidly filling up with immigrants, London is filled with Caribbean people but without the Caribbean Sea in sight, Paris is full of Muezzins and Senegalese but it does not have the desert or river meadows of Africa, Madrid seas reach the South Americans but the Andes and the Amazon jungle are still far away. Europe remains a human-sized continent, as George Steiner would say, the continent of cafes, the continent that was measured by the footsteps of walkers, the continent that has turned its streets and squares into a memory of great men and historical facts, the continent that discovered that God has a human face. Our America is definitely something else, here nature has not been erased, here there are real jungles and real deserts. There all roads lead to Rome, here all the waters seek the river, nothing has human dimensions, everything exceeds us, and God himself needs other faces and other metaphors to be conceived, to be celebrated. It was Paul Verlaine, sensory and musical master of the Hispanic American poets, who wrote in his poetic art that the important thing is not the color but the hue, and I believe that if the peoples of this continent have applied ourselves to something, it is to unfold and delve into the local and particular nuances of a culture whose general outlines are close. By this I mean that a common characteristic of Latin American culture is that nothing in it today can claim to be absolutely native, except perhaps those magical towns of the Amazon that have never come into contact with anything else. In other regions of the world, until recently, one could speak of purity, of pure races, of uncontaminated languages. Here the mixtures began very early, not to reach the undifferentiated but to produce truly new things in all cases. Let's say that in our continental culture almost nothing is native but everything is original. John Keats said that explaining a poem can be equivalent to unweaving the rainbow, we could say the same about the process of revealing all the traditions, all the fusions, that led to the birth of Cumbia or Tango, of Pedro Paramo or Macondo, of the work of Niemeyer or Borges. I was once walking through a museum in Mexico when two people passed me and I overheard one say to the other, there are three cultures in the world, the Asian of rice, the European of wheat and the American of corn. The phrase, received like this by the paths of the wind, as the song says, did not seem so important to me for its content as for its approach. I left Africa out, and that was serious enough, but attributing the ultimate root of culture to food and the basic goods of nature seemed original to me in the profound sense that it speaks of origins. To that extent we could say that although the native peoples of America were very different from each other, Aztecs, Incas, Muiscas, Sioux, Arhuacos, Tainos, the hundreds of peoples that inhabited the continent shared the culture of corn, 
and I am not just talking about eating habits but of the gods, the rites, and the patterns of civilization that are born from it. Today there is a lot of talk about globalization, but that process began centuries ago. Already Christianity, which fused Hebrew myths, Greek ideas, and Roman ambitions in its trinity, was a phenomenon of globalization. And what is usually called the discovery and conquest of America was one of the great outposts of this global wind. Today, if we are globalized in anything, it is in the way in which the different peoples of the world share the products of nature, I have seen cornfields in Illinois, in northern Italy and in the prairies of Kathmandu, I have seen wheat fields in Rosario and in the plains of France, I know of the rice fields of Burma and those of Tolima. This seems to tell us that the gods of the place no longer reign, that many things that were local before are planetary, that the divinities of opium, wine, the muscarid Ammonite or Ryurgit long ago reigned over the entire planet and no longer they establish religions, in the profound sense of rites that bind human beings. In the human, two different tendencies fight and dialogue, the endless desire to take root and the insatiable need for other worlds and other skies. If even the tree, which seems so condemned not to move, throws its clouds of seeds to the wind and makes its children grow far away, what can we say about this species of ours, always dissatisfied, that rooted in the homeland dreams of unknown worlds, and lost in the exile endlessly yearns for the lost paradise? A few weeks ago I was able to see how the Norwegians, great walkers and great navigators, who today live in a prosperous and comfortable country, feel their coast like a beautiful ship stranded in the vicinity of the ice, and live a deep longing for remote lands and torrid seas. This is so intense that they even drink an aquavit that has to have gone south to cross the equator and come back, to have the right taste. The human is a history of diasporas. According to recent news, those 2000 beings that humanity was once reduced to, at the most vulnerable moment of its existence, were scattered in small hordes across the map of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, and when they returned to scene were already so different that they seemed on the verge of configuring several species. We ourselves have to admit that the natives of America, the primitive inhabitants of the territory, arrived one day by ice paths from the steppes of Asia, or sailing from Polynesia to the coasts of Chile. So all rootedness is the son of a previous diaspora, and perhaps all love for the native soil hides the deep nostalgia for a land lost in the meanders of the past. Ours is the age of nations, and among us these nation states are such a recent phenomenon that they can almost be seen with the naked eye. We come from being a subordinate part of the first great planetary empire, and just two centuries ago the different countries emerged to an attempt at independent life. But the societies prior to the arrival of the Europeans had already achieved certain distinctive features that history has not been able to erase, the cult of the mythical father and the dialogue with death typical of Mexican culture, the mythical fragmentation of the territory typical of the Colombian culture, the insularity of Cuban culture, the notion of the triple world typical of the Inca culture, the worlds of the condor, the puma, and the snake, which from early on were the perception of a reality in which they have to dialogue and understand each other in a complex way the snowy mountains, the fertile middle lands and the river Rhine forest. The violent conquest and the colonial age broke many things and added many others to the mosaic, I am thinking of the revival of the cult of the indigenous mother goddess of the lagoons in the form of the mestizo virgins of Guadalupe, or of Chiquinquira. On the main altar of the Church of San Francisco in Quito, there is the image of a winged and pregnant virgin that cannot be found in European Catholic iconography. Many associate it with the winged virgin that Juan de Patmos describes in the Apocalypse, but scholars of colonial religious art see in it a representation of the Inca Pishamama, and say that the carving artist, Bernardo de Legarda, an indigenous Quito, only he encouraged to make his winged virgins, many of them with Indian faces, when he saw Burmese wooden dolls arrive on ships to the Pacific coast. Such are the ways of our culture, sometimes we use the contributions of the whole world to express the deepest and most original of our being. The showy polytheism of Latin American Catholic saints achieves, through complex ritual tricks, that the cult of a single god is not incompatible with the cult of infinite minor, identifiable and specialized divinities. 
and Derek Walcott argued with great beauty and wisdom in his speech to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature, in 1992, that the colonial gaze, the superficial discourse of the metropolises, does not notice that in our apparent imitations there is a new originality, the expression of something that is not derivation but present fullness, that the representation of the Ramayana that countless boys of Hindu origin do in Trinidad in the summer is not a play but a work of faith, it is not imitation. But originality. Nowhere is the way in which what is foreign became its own flesh and blood as clearly seen as in the vast fabric of the European languages that arrived in America, in which the sap of the American world began to circulate very early, and in whose literatures it was emerging the exuberance of the different regions of the continent. American literatures are the result of the meeting of already formed languages with an unknown world. The tension between established languages and the surprising world represented for us, from the beginning, the tension between the real and the magical, since magic is nothing more than what obeys other laws. It is convenient to remember that, although the planet's civilizations record a history several thousand years old, just five centuries ago two halves of the world were completely isolated. The Earth, like the Moon, had a dark side, and the meeting between these two ways of being human, developed independently over the millennia, posed the most exciting challenges for life and for the imagination. It was something even stranger than if Latin had taken root in Africa, it was as if, as a result of adventures in outer space, the Englishman took root on some planet with intelligent life. Now, what happened in the two halves of the American continent is very different. In the North, the English language only had to make an effort to recognize the physical world and allow cultures that came from afar to take root in it, while in Latin America, where diverse and complex civilizations flourished, and where they were not exterminated. Completely the indigenous peoples, the Latin languages had to dialogue with the native languages, although that was not their initial purpose, and they still continue to do so today. What our literature has increasingly shown in recent centuries is the gradual way in which the sap of a native world ascends through a foreign language, with its colors and metaphors, with its most inexplicable dreams and memories. Deepest, with the radical strangeness of its modes of representation. One feels in it the profusion, the exuberance, the color, and the fragrance of a new land, of forests that had never been cut down, of a fertility of the soil, of an abundance of mammals and insects, reptiles, and birds in which our last season may well find the virtues of paradise. The literature of Latin America began with the Chronicles of the Indies. Behind the almost always brutal campaigns of the conquerors advanced an astonished legion of chroniclers who discovered nature, questioned the forests, the soils, the climates, the fauna, the native cultures, their customs, and their mythologies. Given that the great scholars remained in the European world, history had to improvise its historians, its narrators, and its poets, with soldiers full of curiosity rather than information, men barely trained in the cultural tradition of their land of origin, but masters of a singular spirit of observation and of that extraordinary mental audacity that characterized the men of the Renaissance. And there a very significant phenomenon occurred, Many wanted only to sing about the deeds of the great captains of conquest, they wanted to paint their portraits with the background landscape of the American world, but that scenario was so vigorous that many times the portrait was lost behind the jungles and anacondas, alligators, and rivers, storms and birds. The American world advanced like a vine on the pages of the chroniclers, and completely invaded them, and showed them that here man cannot fill the whole picture. The chroniclers of the Indies could not suffice with repeating what they had learned in their world of origin, and given that at the beginning of a literature, naming is equivalent to creating, those adventurers had to invent a language and pave the way for an extraordinary literature. From an early age, art and literature began to speak of the Latin American Baroque. But if the Baroque, as Borges has said, is the final manifestation of all art, that moment in which a language extends its possibilities and adjoins its own caricature, the art of our origins could not correspond to that twilight definition. To Europeans, those facades of Catholic temples seemed Baroque, where the Renaissance decorations were combined in an imaginative and capricious way with the drawings of indigenous traditions, 
but these things were not due to ornamental, ostentatious, or rhetorical reasons, but to specific needs. One of which was to make cultures coexist and merge their symbols in an aesthetic that could hardly be characterized by its austerity. Recently, on a visit to the city of Cuzco, I was told that in the early days, after the cathedral was built on the ruins of the Temple of the Sun, the Catholic priests asked the Inca chiefs why the natives did not enter the temple if there were been built for them. The chiefs replied that they could not see a place where the sun did not enter as a place of worship. The priests then had the idea of opening some windows to the west that would receive the morning light, and placing large mirrors inside so that the light would multiply everywhere. Only after this did the Indians finally enter the temple, but perhaps not entirely to worship the Christian God but because the Sun God had made the enclosure his own. And already in Spain itself there had been fusions between the Christian and the Moorish world for centuries, reality was checkered and so was the imagination. This helps to understand the appearance of a poet as strange and fascinating as Luis de Gongora y Argot, born in what were the old Moorish kingdoms, and whose love for the sound of words seems to belong to the order of Arabic poetry, more interested in for the musicality than for the meaning. Once again, there we find the legend of an influence. The work of the magnificent poet of Tunja, in the 17th century, Hernando Dominguez Camargo, is attributed to an imitation of Gongora's culturanismo. But it must be added that his profusion of metaphors arose from a border zone between different languages, between different mental universes, and also reveals an extreme effort to belong to Europe, but to a Europe inaccessible to a poor cleric from the colonies, a Europe magnified and blurred by distance. Those emphases are rather the extreme tension of a creator who is not in the center of a culture but on its shores, the language of those who dream of other worlds, an adventure of metaphors comparable to the tradition of the northern scalds. The ornamentation of the altarpieces of the temples and of the colonial paintings seems baroque, full of fruits, leaves and new flowers, of an often fabulous bestiary. But how can the representation of pineapples and armadillos be called baroque, if they are not exaggerations or inventions, but classical fidelity to natural forms? It would be as foolish as to speak of the baroque style of the enormous beak of the toucan, the colors of the parrot, or the exuberance of the equinoctial forests. Where nature is exuberant, we are not in the presence of an aesthetic emphasis but of another canon of the natural, of a classicism subject to other laws. Since the Greeks, European art has sought the right measure and balance. It also sought to always hold on to a human pattern, since Europe not only thought that man is the measure of all things, but also came to the conclusion that the human is the very measure of the divine. That is, it seems to me, the meaning of Christianity. And only because of these notions did European art evolve towards the search for perspective, naturalism, the art of portraiture, realism, the meticulousness of drawing, and fidelity to forms, in a way that was already in the Renaissance. Reaching its fullness. But the discovery of America was also a metaphor for the need that Europe felt to come out of itself, the thirst to discover the non-European worlds that were in this world. From the 16th century, in an increasing way, the crisis of the center, the crisis of the form and the crisis of the center began in Europe in all the realms of the spirit, in philosophy, in politics, in art, in poetry. Of the proportion. Dreams of Utopia and the Noble Savage began, of the New Atlantises and the El Dorados, the taste for exotic spices grew, and mythical flights began in search of the new. It is significant that they were the final discoverers of other aesthetic traditions, impressionists and expressionists, who undertook a struggle against the sharpness of drawing, a process of experimentation and abandonment of narrow canons and rigid rules. American art is born from a tension between the forms of European language and the convulsions of a world that cannot be exhausted in the human. As he said, before Steiner, the Englishman Auden, there are true jungles and true virgin lands in America, inordinate rivers and misunderstood civilizations. In Europe, said Auden, a traveler, no matter how lost, is half an hour from an inhabited place, while there is no American who has not seen with his eyes lands practically untouched by history. Here the human pattern fails to imprison all meaning, 
and the artists felt the need to transgress the golden standard, the European scale of proportions. That is less difficult now, because European art has also launched itself in search of a new sense of beauty, and already in the 19th century the man who synthesized those searches of modernity, Charles Baudelaire, had written in one of his poems, Plonger au fond du gouffre, and for au you seal, chu import. Slash au fond de l'an canu pour trouver du nouveau. Dive to the bottom of the abyss, hell, or heaven, what does it matter? Slash to the bottom of the unknown to find the new. Every inhabitant of America, despite his efforts to inhabit the polis in the urban sense of the term, lives in the vicinity of a nature not fully conquered, half nameless, largely unknown. When we think that almost the entire European pharmacy is born from the knowledge of the 6,000 plant species that populate the continent, and that equinoctial America has 50,000 species of plants, of whose properties only Amazonian shamans have a profound knowledge, we will better understand what is the overwhelming sense of the presence of nature in the imaginary of the American man. Nature is not something known here, the truth is that it is nowhere, but in America it is more difficult to fall into the illusion that we have the world dominated and subjugated, that we have domesticated it. And this, which could seem like an external phenomenon, the type of relationship we establish with forests and rivers, with animals and climates, is something that also includes the relationship with our own sense of humanity and with our own body. Our America is still the kingdom of perplexity, and the tensions and imbalances between reality and language, miscegenations and syncretism contribute equally to this. It is still amazing that these lands, already sufficiently complex due to their geographical and biological composition, have been enriched even more with the contribution of races, languages, traditions, religions, philosophies, economic models and political ideals from elsewhere. I think of my country, Colombia, for example, where we are not mainly white Europeans, American Indians or black Africans, but rather one of the most mestizo countries on the continent, in a region that is both Caribbean, Pacific Rim, Andean and Amazonian, which speaks a language that is the illustrious daughter of Latin and Greek, which professes a religion of Hebrew, Greek, and Roman origins, which has adopted institutions born of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, which was incorporated into the order of mercantile society and the dynamics of globalization for five centuries now, and I feel that we are truly needed from the planetary clay, I think of this Latin America, which produced a good part of the riches with which modern European civilization was built, and I tell myself that it is hardly understandable that the art and literature that emerge from that colorful complexity are more full of fusions than they seem. One can imagine. And that these mergers can reach exciting time synthesis of planetary culture. One of the most interesting phenomena of our American world and especially of the equinoctial region is the way in which we participate in the equatorial strip, the fourth parallel that produces not only the greatest biological diversity but also a good part of the oxygen that the planet breathes. It is the region where there are no seasons, that is, where nature does not rest, where the soil does not sleep, where the sun and the water remain, so to speak, in permanent insomnia. It would seem that it is the perfect region for dreams to spring from wakefulness. The light produces another color, the sky is clouded with gigantic clouds, the rain sometimes produces endless deluges, it is a region of fantastic electrical storms, deafening thunder, floods and avalanches. The rivers change their channels and the surface of the earth shudders at times, accommodating itself to the activity of the depths. We are not fully indigenous, nor European, nor African, but we are constantly nurtured by those origins while at the same time differentiating ourselves from them. Not long ago, a writer friend of mine, from a population that is increasingly asserting itself as Afro-Colombian, had the opportunity to meet a writer from Africa, and he expressed his joy at being talking to someone with whom he could fully identify. The other, with great courtesy and wisdom at the same time, told him that the two of them were not very alike. And of course I was saying it mostly to formulate an unspoken challenge. In reality we are different he told him, we are Africans, you are black. My friend listened to him with surprise. 
And the man from Africa added, You are descended from slaves. We have never been slaves. It is evident that the black Americans have to affirm themselves in something more than in their common African origin, without denying it, they have to feel more decidedly a mythological part of the American world, and fight for their originality here, in dialogue with this world in which they have lived for five centuries. Also for them are those verses by Leopoldo Lagones. May our land want to save us from oblivion, slash for these four centuries that we have served in it. And at the same time, we must know that without that vital sap that came from Africa, no one in Latin America would be what it is. We all have the right to claim the part of Africa in our rhythm, in our flesh and in our imagination. It's all a matter of seeing the nuances well. And the same can be said of the part of Europe and the part of America. We Hispanic Americans can feel Spanish only until the day we go to Spain, that day we understand forever that we are something else, and that discovery can even help us to love Spain, to admire Spain, to discover Spain. Now, the way in which the indigenous is in our mestizo culture is easier for me to think about if I resort to literature. I feel that there is, for example, in the work of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a way of thinking that is not strictly Western, that is resolved in images and variations, like a halo or glow of the central events. It would seem that there is something of indigenous stock in a certain way of presenting the facts and of not resolving them through arguments, digressions, and theories, but through strokes and figures that satisfy feeling and imagination at the same time. Garcia Marquez belongs to a world deeply influenced by this magical thinking, but he often repeats that despite knowing very well what the story was like, or the river of stories, that he planned to narrate, he clearly found his tone and the certainty of his resources when read the novel Pedro Paramo, by the Mexican Juan Rolfo. Perhaps he was affected by the freedom with which Rolfo allows himself to be influenced by the wind of indigenous voices, by the manner of these American dreams, by the persistence in daily life of the profound myths of his people. Thus, in the novel 100 Years of Solitude we know nothing of the unique relationship between the mother, Ursula Iguaran, and her eldest son, Jose Arcadio, until the day he decides to leave town, enrolling in the gypsy troop. As soon as she realizes his absence, Ursula goes in search of him, abandoning everything else, her husband, her house, her other children, ceasing to be the center of gravity of her world. Jose Arcadio is the first native to leave the town and go away to the distant world that his father has always dreamed of. Going after him, Ursula feels so far away that she doesn't even think about going back, and finally finds the path to the world that all the men in town had searched for in vain. Years later, the son returns, transformed by the absence, crosses the town and the house and advances without stopping through the corridors and rooms, waving to those he sees, but he only reaches the end of his journey when he finds Ursula. He is retracing the path of his escape, the path on which his mother had followed him, and only stops when he reaches her again. That double movement that first reveals the importance that the son has for her, and then the importance that the mother has for him, shows the invisible bond that unites them and that their dialogues never betrayed. And it is because of this secret drawing, intensely traced in us by the story, it is because of that furrow between the two that, without knowing it, we are willing to believe one of the most powerful fantastic episodes of the novel, the one in which a thread of blood comes out of the dead son, he goes through corridors and streets and platforms, and does not stop until he finds Ursula and brings her the message of death. Again we see the opposite movement, and it is now she who, following the thread, finally finds the body of her son. This ancestral drawing of the thread of blood that seeks its source is one of the most beautiful and memorable images of the novel, and I suspect that our minds host it with such ease and gratitude because it is not an arbitrary line but a necessity of the story, shows us powerfully, with the power of poetry and myth, the unexpressed relationship of the son with the mother, the bond of maternal blood converted into the path of the son, the path of his escapes and his returns, of his loneliness, and his death. Something in the modern Western novel has tended to abandon the free games of the imagination, to subordinate stories to ideas, and to abound in theses and theories. 
from Dostoevsky's detailed reflections on the motives of human behavior, through the overabundance of intellectual purposes in James Joyce's Infinite Ulysses, to the essayistic tone of many Thomas Mann novels, narrative often sought to abandon the old habit of to dream freely, to give flight to the imagination and to allow the fantastic and the real to be combined at will. That had been the spirit of the classical epics, of the stories of the Brittany cycle, of the Nibelungen lead, of the Dantesque comedy, and of Orlando Furioso. And, of course, that is the spirit of the two Eastern works that have most influenced our civilization, the Bible and the Thousand and One Nights. What most amazed Baron Alexander von Humboldt on his journey through equinoctial America was the impossibility of finding, as in Europe, forests of a single species, because dozens of different species proliferated in each small space. What best illustrates the correspondence of our literature with this world is the feverish abundance of the forms of its imagination, not only the liveliness of the elements and the intensity of color, what Chesterton would call, speaking of the possible creole origin of Robert Browning, a theory of orchids and cockatoos, but even the continuous tendency to contrast different stages of the metamorphosis of facts and things. In our continent time flows in a vertiginous way. We have had to pass in five centuries from the high community empires to the disintegrations of post-modernity, from the vast and unscathed continental jungle to the apocalyptic walls of the fires that surround and eat away at the Amazon jungle to plant soybeans, from the bison and from the Indian to plains crashing into the glass cliffs of the Twin Towers. For a long time, Latin America was spent in the effort to achieve its own language, to convert the arrogant and rigid languages that arrived from Europe into languages nourished by the sap of the New World. Only at the end of the 19th century, with the work of the extraordinary poets and narrators whom we call modernists, symbolized by the most melodious of them, the Nicaraguan Ruben Dario, did we finally conquer literary resources capable of facing the challenge of fully naming our world, and to dialogue with the other literatures of the planet. The 20th century has seen us undertake this task, the works of the modernists, of Ruben Dario, of the Mexican Alfonso Reyes, of so many authors throughout the continent, have matured those resources. And later, among the numerous authors of the half-century and of the so-called magical realism, many voices emerged that in some way summarize the plurality of that continental clamor. Among them it is necessary to mention Juan Rolfo, whose brief and inexhaustible work shows the journeys of the Spanish language in the depth of Mexican memory, to Pablo Neruda, whose Song of Stone and of Jungles explores and celebrates nature and history alike, to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, whose pagan Bible of the Caribbean condenses the eloquence of the language of Cervantes, the magical thinking of indigenous peoples and the joy, color, and sensuality of the children of Africa, and to Jorge Luis Borges, who, interested in gaucho poetry and the Jewish Kabbalah, Islam, and Buddhism, the mythologies of Hindustan and the Nordic sagas, in the largest country of immigrants, knew how to collect the memory of all libraries and feel the murmur of the entire planet mixed in our veins and in our souls. We still have the duty to question how our dialogue between the one and the diverse can be, but I would say that we will not be able to integrate Latin America as long as we refuse to see the infinity of its nuances, the subtle richness of its differences. It is urgent to abandon the disastrous concepts of underdevelopment and the third world, which sought to make development a predetermined and external path. Children of the Age of Discoveries, engendered in the first outposts of mercantilism, heirs to the languages, religions, and institutions of Europe, we are the first great fruit of globalization. But now it becomes clear that the emphasis on the universal immediately awakens the need for and defense of the local. Since the imperative preaching of globalization began, nations are no longer enough for us, each region of the globe, each village, each tradition struggles to speak, to differentiate itself, to exist. There is a verse by the poet Leon de Grave, which he mischievously called, the definitive and paradoxical formula. That formula says, everything is worth nothing if the rest is worth less. It is paradoxical that someone speaks of everything and the rest, but in logical terms it is understandable. The whole is not only the sum of the parts, it is also different from the parts. And it is not possible to speak of the whole, 
of love for the totality, to preach the neglect of the particular and the fragmentary. I think that formula means, the forest is worth nothing if the tree is worth less, the species is worth nothing if the individual is worth less, the universe is worth nothing if every place in it is worthless. Nations are important, but we urgently need a new dialogue, from each place with all the others and from the local with the universe. It would seem that we need a dialogue between the gods of the place with the omnipresent and dispersed god of Spinoza, and this supposes not only respect for the universe as a whole, for the planet as a whole, but also the recovery of the sacred meaning of each stream and of each rock, of each tree and of each creature. And I believe that it is not politics but art that knows how to see the whole and the detail at the same time. It is true that human beings cannot survive without disturbing, but we are already beginning to understand that we will not survive if we disturb too much. Today the world feels the onerous weight of the human species, it notices its presence too much, it feels the rudeness and clumsiness of our relationship with things, and it is evident that it is necessary to learn lightness, not to weigh too much, learning of a certain invisibility, so contrary to this modern mania for what is excessively visible and strident, the learning of delicacy, and the learning of subtlety. What the first critics of modernity guessed, that God is in the details, that the important thing is the nuance, more than the color, that in the face of the excessive claim to knowledge we do not need to understand everything but understand it, and that we do not need to know everything to enjoy and appreciate it. We can say that Latin America is one of the few places on the planet where nature still remains, highly damaged but still full of its original attributes. We are, furthermore, the Europe that left and that mixed with what is different, and we have a lot to teach that Europe that is only now feeling the physical neighborhood of the rest of the world. Our rich continental culture has experienced fusions and has reached powerful synthesis. The evils of the world are better seen from the edges than from the center, because the old centers were always too smug about their importance and did not see beyond their horizon, and instead the new centers of the sphere participate in the attributes of the center. And from the shore. To that extent it is true that in the basements of our cities is the Aleph, is the universe. We have a world half conquered, and half delayed, fortunately, in its original attributes. Modernity, the technological age, the scientific prodigy have bewitched our reality in a fascinating and dangerous way. We are, as the poet Aurelio Arturo says, with one foot in a haunted chamber and the other on the edge of the valley, where the starry night boils. And nothing is as important as finding a balance between our ability to change the world and our need to preserve it, between the task of building a human dwelling and the profound duty to respect the natural universe. If our nations were the first modern fruits of globalization, they are propitious scenarios for us to also find their limits. Because the human species, vain of its rights, has forgotten the question of its limits and urgently needs a responsible and clear sense of those limits. On that delicate task, the fate of the world might well depend. Finish. The Secret Drawing of Latin America. William Ospina.